This rugged and beautiful landscape was once the scene of a short but brutal conflict. In 1982, a small British overseas territory in the South Atlantic, known as the Falkland Islands, was invaded by Argentina. A task force set sail from Britain to reclaim the islands. Over a hundred vessels and nearly 26,000 men and women. Some were as young as 18. It was the moment I was, basically, I was robbed of my youth. I don't think anybody as a 19-year-old should witness that much death. The British defeated the Argentines in just three and a half weeks and returned home victorious. But what happened after the parades were finished and the flags were put away? I just blanked it at first, I was still young and... But as I grew older, it started eating away at me, like... One of the veterans has used art to cope with his trauma. I think a lot of the pain that I suffered from the Falklands, I've kind of alleviated it with being able to do art connected with it, so I'm lucky that I have that safety valve. We'll use his animations to explore how fighting a war continues to affect soldiers even decades later. He's a devil, really, because you can't see the injury. Everybody thinks you're all right, but underneath you're screaming. And now, Panorama. Good evening. The government, the country, perhaps the world itself, sits precariously balanced this evening between terrible fighting and a peaceful solution to the Falklands crisis. The first time I heard about the Falklands, I thought they got a cheek trying to come into Scotland, because that's where I thought the Fal Falkland Islands was. Panorama is following a group of former Welsh guards who have remained friends as they fly 8,000 miles back to the Falklands to confront their demons for the first time in 35 years. As teenagers, they knew little of what they were getting themselves into. When you're 19 years of age, you are a superman. You can walk through walls. You are indestructible. You're the master of the universe. You've, you've got everything in front of you. Yeah, 19 year old. Not a care in the world, nothing at all. The world is my oyster, then, you know. For all their useful bravado, all were affected by their exposure to the horrors of war and still bear the psychological scars. Fifty-three year old Nigel O'Keefe is divorced and lives alone. When I first moved here, my the kids used to come in all the time, but um, because of my alcohol problems, they've stopped coming in. And that's what I miss a lot, is uh, my kids. It's not their fault, it's my fault. But I have grandkids now, and my kids don't want them to see that, you know? They want to put me in a nice light, not nonsense I'm going through at the moment, you know. Like many veterans, Mick Hermanis suffers from survivor guilt. I got a dread of my life to go back. It's very, very daunting for me. We had the highest losses from the British Army. We left a lot of really good friends down there. It, it has affected me. I was, I was diagnosed with PTSD about uh, 20 odd years ago. Uh, I had nightmares for a few years due to my own sanity and bits and pieces. Like I got getting very angry. Not for, for what happened in the falls, what happened afterwards, the aftermath. You know, if somebody say something, then it might be under normal circumstances, you just brush it off. Uh, you go absolutely berserk. Paul Bromwell has suffered from bouts of aggression and severe insomnia. He runs veteran self-help groups and takes care of mistreated horses, which often exhibit similar signs of anxiety and stress. I lost a lot of friends. I think it marked me for the rest of my life. But since then, since I come back, I do have what you call a ghost around. I see things when I'm 
sleep in. The army changes you big time because they empty you of what you were. Make it, they make it what they want. But then when you get out, you're still what they want. But you don't fit in the society anymore. Yeah, what happens is you seem to put a barrier up. Um, so that the hurt that you carry and you don't seem to let it out. You just keep it in. You're, you're taught that way when you're going through training. That's one of the principles where they put, you get rid of your emotions and you carry on. It doesn't matter whatever happens, you know. But by putting that barrier up, I don't think it ever, ever comes back down. The fresh-faced Will Kevins, seen here age 19, worked as part of a detail clearing corpses and moving the sick and injured. We cleaned up the hospital and obviously there'd been a lot of amputations. And we, one of, I think, 82 Lewis, he picked up and said, what's this? And he picked this thing up and his foot just fell on the floor and it was like a, a foot that had been blown off. Um, so. There were just bits and pieces of, of people in the hospital that we needed to incinerate. We'd be, that was our detail for the day. And this is just all part of the journey. For me, this is the catalyst. And now the journey going back to the Falklands and I guess reliving it, I suppose, and trying to make more sense of it. I know it's going to hurt, but I just want to go back there and see it through to the end. The first time these former Welsh guards arrived on the island, it was on a hastily converted luxury cruise ship, the QE2. This time, it's courtesy of the Ministry of Defence, who supply cheap flights for veterans wishing to return to the Falklands. Absolutely amazing to be with old friends. Let's do this. I'm extremely excited and ready to rock and roll. <laughs> Joined by other veterans, our group travels to San Carlos, where they first arrived in 1982. First landed. This is it. This is San Carlos. Right now, right now, right now. Straight on, man. Straight on. There was just ships galore. You couldn't even see nothing but ships out there. It was absolutely teeming with ships. This is what they call Barmali. It was like as if we'd step back in time with the, the guys that was landing on the beach of the Second World War. In your head, this is what we were going to do. But where we could see it was just chaos. It was equipment everywhere. It was. Everything blowing in your face, and the sh bigger shock was how cold it was. Once landed at San Carlos, the infantry needed to carry all equipment on foot, including weapons, ammunition, and provisions. Each man was carrying around 60 kilos. And I was carrying a, a, probably the weight of a, a human being on my back through ground. Well, you can have a look at what the ground is like around it. It's, it's chaos. It's surreal being back here. It's totally surreal. Flashback! I got to cross a jet, you know. Rambo! <laughs> In 1982, British forces marched 90 miles from San Carlos to the capital, Port Stanley. A combination of tactical factors meant that many of the Welsh Guards did not complete this march. Bad press in the years after the war accused them of not having been fit enough to do the march. Stung by this criticism, the men are determined to prove their detractors wrong by doing the 90-mile tactical advance to battle, or TAB. It's like a pilgrimage, really. We want to retrace our steps and do the marks that we didn't do back in the day that the Paris and the Marines did. Their route will take them past significant battlegrounds. And along the way, each man intends to revisit the scene of a traumatic incident which has haunted him ever since. So I have a lot of emotions That's about right. it. It's very personal. It's, it's a personal thing. Yeah. For the sake of your own... Your yeah, own, for uh, your own sanity. Sanity and that. It's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. <laughs> But before they hit the road tomorrow, the team tuck into their rations, something slightly better than they had back in 82. Look at this lamb for you, boys, right? 
And the chef now, right? Steve, what, what a job he's done. That term very loosely, chef, mind, all right? <laughs> Sorry, we're doing Welsh guards first, then Paris. I was just saying really nice things. Today, the men will march 22 miles from San Carlos to Goose Green. Oh, it's just a thrill coming back here and doing this. And it's, and it's fitting, because at walking pace, your mind is ticking over, and you're un all the memories are unravelling, and it's very cathartic. And I think we're all going to be talking about what happened and dealing with all the demons that each of us have. Mick's trauma and survivor guilt are embodied in the carrying of his Bergen, or army backpack, throughout the 90-mile hike to Port Stanley. This, this bag symbolises the baggage I've been carrying for 35 years. Mental baggage. And the weather is virtually identical to the way it was back in the day. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's bad, though. That's opened the lungs up. That last still nearly paralyzed me. Oh. So it's busting for a piss. They might be 8,000 miles from home, but the weather is decidedly Welsh. After five gruelling miles, it all proves too much for Nigel, and he's forced to continue the journey by car. It's about a mile now. About a mile, I've said that, five miles ago. Twenty odd miles later, and it's time for some much needed R&R, thanks to the hospitality of two locals. Jan gave us a call to see if uh, we could put them up. And the answer's always yes. The connectivity with this island is so strong. And what we did when we were young men, to come back here and fight, and the respect that the locals have for us, it's, it's, it just means so much. My foot, I tell you what, I've got this bastard goat. I can feel it. Yeah. Bad job either. Oh, I know they're bad. Nigel is suffering too, but not with his feet. Apart from his poor general health, the return to these islands is bringing back some unwanted memories. Once the joker of the gang, seen here on the QE2 en route to the Falklands, he has his own demons to deal with. One of the problems I have before I came out here, uh, I'm alcohol dependent. I've been alcohol dependent for quite some years and I often ask myself why am I drinking every day and every night and I'm not stopping and so I have myself put it down to being over here, I suppose, you know? And what happened over here? Nigel's defining memory of the Falklands War was when his platoon found itself in a minefield laid by the Argentinians. We were advancing. It was pitch black. There was tracer flying everywhere. And a guy from the SES came running up the single fire line and told everyone to stop. So we say we're in a minefield. And as soon as he sold us that, I could hear this screaming. I pitched, really, really high pitched screaming, and I said, what the hell are women and kids doing out here? Like, I found out then it was two Royal Marines who'd stepped on anti-personnel mines, and that's what the screaming was. I've never heard a grown man scream so high pitched like that. We come together, here we go. To me, in my mind, it's like, it was like an old film. It is like, did that really happen? Like that type of thing. And maybe now when I see it again, I realize it was real, like, no? The day doesn't end well for Nigel, as once more he finds himself unable to cope. I say, I'm really, really worried about Nigel. He doesn't look very well. He's come over all clam. He's been sick. 
he really shouldn't have come out. Ah. St. Paul said we shouldn't have bloody brought him out. I knew, but right? honestly, yeah, what but I said, I, I said to everyone, I t honestly, right, but, I said, yeah, let me tell you now, right? He wanted to come. I work with people I got every day. He wanted to come. Right? right? It's, just, it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah. It's a tough it's one. It's a tough one. But would you have told him you can't come? It's a shame because, you know, what we went through 35 years ago, it's, 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 it's affected us all in different ways. To see someone, I guess, now. With Nigel recovering in hospital, the group is one man down. Coming all this way, 8,000 miles, and straight into hospital. <laughs> Unbelievable. Did we always say last day? Sheep, 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 sheep. Today uh, we're marching to Fitzroy, um, where the Welsh Guards got uh, got hit on the Sigalahad. So it's a very significant day for Mick. Very significant day for a lot of us, really. Yeah, I appreciate it. Now we've enjoyed having you. Right, charge. Oh, it's been a pleasure. You take care. Our lunch up there on the hill. <laughs> the group reached Fitzroy Bay six hours later. 48 soldiers and crew were killed here when the ship Sir Galahad was bombed by the Argentinian Air Force. This is where the Welsh Guards suffered their heaviest losses. This is it. It's where we came ashore. Mick was one of hundreds of Welsh guards being transported on the ship. Please came in and hit us half past four in the afternoon. Bang. And then whoosh. Thrown through the air. Got thrown about 15 foot. And you're trying to get guys out and you're choking. Some of the guys he went back down and pulled, you know, I'm talking and heroes there. What they done? If you ever see somebody who got a pair of marigold gloves, they peeled them off and just left them hanging by their fingers. With the flash had blown his skin off his hands. And he had roses tattooed on his hands. You could see the tattoos down there on his skin where they'd come off. The smell was horrendous. Yeah, the explosives and burning flesh, right? It was... It, it really got into you, got into you, like, yeah, and it's, 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 it hung on you. Many men were trapped below deck in the burning hold. Guys going back in there, I had a look. I didn't have the guts for it. You just not... and I, and I, well, yeah, that really... I just... I can't go back in there. <sighs> Dear me. <laughs> when Mick returned home, his survivor guilt was only intensified by the warmth of his hero's welcome. <laughs> All the neighbours in the street are out in the bloody big hero's, hero's welcome. As I come up that door, it's, it's a big picture. The Welsh Guards rugby team and uh, the first to o'clock is Cliff and Yorkie. He got killed on a gun like that, you know, and I, I just broke down. Why? So he killed me, broke my heart. See my mates and I'm getting a bloody hero's welcome and my two mates in there. This felt shocking. Hi, right, boys. Hello, mate. Oh, come here, come here, come here. Yeah, Steve, get in. Get in, Steve. Get in it's all gone by the way now, boy. All gone by the way. The men leave Fitzroy with heavy hearts. It's unlikely they will ever return.
I think the hardest thing was, especially with Mike Armanis and a few of the other boys, Fitzroy, the actual Fitzroy itself, is such a big thing and it's such... When they got there, yes, they're very emotional. Uh, he finds now it's hard to leave there and start walking all over again. And that was the biggest thing this morning, was trying to get re-motivated to carry on walking. The approach to the capital, Port Stanley, takes them past the battleground, Mount Harriet. Paul Bromwell was part of a recce unit leading the way up the mountains and paving the way for the paras and marines. Paul had walked some 70 miles in sub-zero temperatures by this point. It was one of the hardest tracks I've ever done. You can imagine yourself doing a marathon. This is, I, I'd done a couple of marathons by the time I got here. It was minus three. Ice rain, and we were put in positions right round the bottom of Mount Harriet. The Argentines were well dug in and convinced that the British would never attempt something as foolhardy as storming the mountain at night in these conditions. That underestimation proved their downfall. Where we could see a lot of movement and a lot of fire coming in, it was coming in both ways. We all opened up, and whatever we could see, we put enough firepower down to let the Marines go forward. You're just waiting for something to go wrong, you know? Despite what Paul and his comrades suffered that night, a plaque on the site fails to even mention them. We, we fought on this mountain, and yet it never comes out. It's always the other regiments have taken that, that they've done everything. There's no mention on here whatsoever about what the Welsh Guard's done on this mountain itself. I don't want this sort of to leave my life all the time, but it never goes away. It was so, so surreal to be involved in this. And then within a week, I'm walking down the street at home, and it was like two worlds apart. I'd been through hell, and when I went home, it just seemed nothing had changed. Everybody had, was carrying on with their life. And yet inside, I was hurting a lot, so much. I'd lost too many good friends. It's the last push to Port Stanley. And for Will, the incident that has most haunted him occurred after the Argentine surrender on this road. I remember walking up and seeing something in the road and it was the body of a dead Argentinian. And for reasons I still don't understand today, I put my hand down and I wanted to look at the guy's face. And I picked his head up and I looked at no face. There was no face there at all. It was just a cross section of his skull all of his teeth were all over the place. There was bone fragments and blood all over the place. And, it, uh, and it's something that was ha has haunted me for a very long time, seeing that. And that's what I remember about coming into Port Stanley. Some of the lads were looking through his possessions and they found photographs of his family. And it just, it, it made me think immediately that this guy could have been me, could have been any of us. He was just a soldier fighting for a war that he probably didn't believe in, in a foreign country, and a place that he'd never heard of, and a, probably as scared as me, and unfortunately had been killed. Covering an average of 22 miles a day, the men have done their march in four days. Not bad for 10 old Jerry Hattricks. Exactly, we've done pretty good. <laughs> I started blubbing coming up the hills, you're seven Steve. Yeah, I'm proud of soul, mate. Proud of soul. That's the only one, mate. Yeah. Set a few demons to rest now. Yeah. Max East didn't suck on that. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray. Oh. Oh. Come on, boys, all together, all together. One, two, three, bang, we've done it. Well then, boys, let's get some photos. Let's get some photos. This is it. Cheers, mate. Star. I've been carrying this, my fault as was over, but 35 yeah. years, this is it, the monkey's off my back. 
Get in there. That's it. Baggage ended. The Argentines lost 649 men, almost three times that of the British. When the conflict was over, Will and some comrades were detailed to return 500 Argentinian prisoners using a modified old seal and cross-channel ferry, which had sailed all the way from the UK. During this time, they discovered a poignant connection with the prisoners. We were uh, a section to deal with, uh, with the prisoners on the car deck. We had about 500 of these uh, engineers who'd helped clear the mines. And we were taking them back to uh, Puerto Madryn in, uh, in Argentina on this cross-channel ferry. And uh, my mate, Forty Williams, uh, strikes up a, a conversation with one of these guys. They can barely speak each other's languages, but it, it transpires that some of the prisoners we had were Welsh because when the Welsh were oppressed, they left Wales to go and settle in Patagonia. And yet we're fighting with each other. It's St David's Day, exactly 102 years since the formation of the Welsh Guards. A fitting time to pay their respects to fallen comrades. closure, it's closure, you know. I can go home now and not think about this place no more. And I can move on in my life now. I think it's about the futility of war. I think you realise what a futile thing it is. I mean, obviously, we achieved an objective by going there and taking the islands back, and that needed to be done. But at what cost? At what cost? You know. Should we go on? Let's go. Let's go. This is not a single day you don't go by, you don't think about it. Think about the boys, friends that we lost in this. There are some bloody fantastic boys we lost up there. People forget when they walk in the street and do when they show up in every day. Is that freedom for them to do that? Somebody have paid for it somewhere. And I know that a lot of my mates, they paid for it with their lives. Look, freedom isn't free. Somebody's paying for it. Through these fields of destruction, baptisms of fire, I've witnessed your son. In the fear and love. 